Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for your interest and for making the time to join us. I'm Martin Rullo. I am the project producer for the 2020 project this afternoon. And I will be um, chairing this session, starting with a, a brief introduction of the uh, 2020 project. Still quite a few people coming in. So the aims of the session are this afternoon to briefly introduce you to the 2020 project, to share some information on the 12 partners involved in our second and final call for artists. Uh, and our partners are joining us this afternoon, so you will be able to uh, ask them questions about their collection specifically and the opportunities that they uh, will be offering with the 2020 project. So these are broadly the aims of the session this afternoon. Before we begin, I would uh, just like to get a few uh, items of housekeeping out way as I'm still in the session. Uh, please keep your microphones and cameras off unless you are asking a question. So there will be a time at the end of the session to ask questions um, on camera. Uh, if you have questions directed to our partners, uh, you may put them uh, in the chat as the session goes on and we will try to answer them as, as quickly as we can. Um, if your question remains unanswered or we do not have time to take all questions um, this afternoon, do not worry. Uh, the call for artists is uh, live until the 6th of February and we will be answering uh, emails at uh, contact2020 at arts.ac.uk. So there will be plenty of opportunities to answer questions outside of this information session if your question is not answered this afternoon. Uh, the session is being recorded and the recording will be uh, made uh, accessible on our website after this information session. Um, if you need it at all, you can accept the live transcript option. Finally, please note that uh, we will make this available uh, and we will be adapting our uh, uh, FAQs on our website and in our call for artists after the session uh, if questions uh, that are raised this afternoon are uh, of interest to multiple uh, artists or people interested in applying to this opportunity. So uh, we are joined today by Maya Little, who is the 2020 project assistant. Maya, if you can wave. Uh, Maya is uh, instrumental to this project and she uh, will be manning, or rather womaning, uh, all of the tech behind the scenes. Uh, and you will most likely encounter Maya again uh, going forward in applying for the project. Um, unfortunately, Professor Susan Pui San Lok, UAL Professor in Contemporary Art and Director of the Decolonizing Arts Institute, could not join us this afternoon. But uh, Susan uh, is the uh, person who started uh, the project, the 2020 project. Um, this afternoon, we will be joined by representatives of our collections, uh, our partner collections, and we'll hear from them all shortly. There will be a five minute break about halfway through this afternoon, as it is a quite a, a long session. So we will uh, have a five minute break after an initial flurry of presentations. And then we will have another uh, series of presentations after the break. And I will then uh, take you through the next steps in applying for the programme, the project. And at the end, there will be time for uh, live questions. So what is 2020? 
2020 is an ambitious uh, three-year program that was announced by the Decolonizing Arts Institute um, in November 2021. It was supported, it is supported by funding from the Arts Council uh, England, a freelance foundation and UAL. Uh, it combines artist residencies with artistic commissioning at scale. So 2020 is bringing together 20 emerging artists mm -hmm. of colour and 20 UK public art collections leading to 20 new permanent acquisitions. In September 2022, a first cohort of eight artists began their collection uh, residencies uh, and we are uh, currently working with them actively. So you have Hannah Sabapathy uh, working uh, with the Harris. We have Gail Chong Kwan, who is working at uh, Compton Verney. Maddie Akaya Baskerville, who is working at the Lightbox. Habib Hajjali, who's joined Palant House. Shanice Oretha, who is uh, working with the Hepworth Wakefield. Yen Fong Ling, who's working with Sheffield Museums. Aksa Harif is working with uh, D. Kelvin Grove in Glasgow, and Jamila Prowse is working with Ndaka. Selected artists uh, in cohort two will receive the, uh, the same uh, benefits as the artists uh, from cohort one. That is to say a, uh, an artist fee of £10,000 uh, and access to £15,000 for research, development and production of a work. Uh, the 2020 team is providing directorial, pastoral and project management, as well as administrative support uh, to the relationship between the artist and the collection. The host collection will assign an institutional mentor and identify key organisational contacts to support the artist. So we'll facilitate working across the organisation towards the realisation of a, a residency project. Uh, the host collection will also introduce the artist to the organisation's relevant key staff at all levels and check in regularly with the artist to address pastoral research or collection access needs. So the for uh, what will the artist uh, need to do while in residency there will be an initial period of research and development uh, this is to make an initial physical side visit to meet the host collection and the uh, 2020 team they will participate in regular virtual check-in meetings to update on progress and ensure support is in place and artists will also engage virtually or physically with the host collections over the uh, research and development period. During the production phase of the residency, artists will develop a new work for accession in any media and scale to be agreed with the host collection and the 2020 director, Susan puissan -Lock. Uh, the artists will also contribute an original digital print design to the 2020 print portfolio, which will be gifted to the partner collections for accession. To participate in the wider 2020 programme is also something that is uh, expected of the artists. There will be 2020 network meetings that bring together artists, curators and collection staff. Uh, an interview with a writer commissioned to produce an original essay on the artist's work. A project evaluation interview with an independent arts consultant. The 2020 end of project symposium and relevant activity in the host collections public programme. Here we are. So we can now introduce our first uh, collection partners. We're going to do a quick round of introduction to the first six of our partners. And then we will play pre-recorded uh, videos for you to uh, get a sense of what the collections have to offer. 
Uh, this should take us to uh, about 2.40, and then we will take a, a short five-minute break. So we will start with a brief introduction from Katie Morton from Birmingham Museums. Katie, if you could join us on camera, please. Up to you, Katie, for your one minute introduction, please. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Katie Morton. I'm the exhibitions team leader at Birmingham Museums Trust. Um, Birmingham civic collection is vast and covers almost every subject across art, decorative arts, natural science, human history and science and technology. The 2020 artists residency will be focused on the Museum Collection Centre, where over 800,000 objects are held in storage and form a really brilliant resource for artists to work with. We're really excited to be part of 2020 because we're committed to interrogating and diversifying our collections to better engage with and be much more meaningful to all Birmingham people. Thank you very much, Katie. If we can follow with Steve from the box. Hi uh, everyone, I'm Steve Conway uh, from The Box uh, down in Plymouth in the southwest. Uh, the Box opened in 2020 and combined the museum and library building with a new extension and a refurbished uh, St Luke's Church. Uh, we've got three times as much gallery space and provide new collection stores. Our key collections are right across the board from archaeology to uh, digital. Um, we've got amazing media collections and a media work suite, um, which uh, we um, digitise a lot of our collections. We've got storage across the board for um, archaeology and social history. We've got an amazing fine art collection, which includes the designated Catonian collection of uh, um, objects ranging from uh, Bernini sculpture to um, uh, to to, to uh, um, amazing other drawings, which I can't think about right now. Uh, we've got Rubens, which is soon going on display. Um, we're really committed to uh, decolonisation, and uh, you know, uh, Plymouth as a city was demolished in World War Two, rebuilt in the fifties, and um, really now I think we consider that Plymouth is uh, undergoing a, a second uh, renaissance. Uh, focused on um, decolonisation um, and driven by our team here at the box. Lovely, thank you, Steve. If we could have Kirsty from Bradford Museums next, please. Hi, yes, um, my name is Kirsty and I am one of the curators at Bradford Museums and Galleries. Um, we have a really diverse collection um, here at Bradford, um, which is really good. Um, and our permanent galleries are displayed um, with all work kind of hung alongside one another. We focus more on kind of stories like place and people um, and try to kind of diversify that through our artworks. Um, but these are all curated by, you know, museum and gallery staff. Um, and what we're looking at more um, at the moment is doing co-curations with community groups and artists to kind of maybe bring some of the stories out that we don't, automatically think of or, or know of um, with works and objects in our collections. Um, so yeah, that's what we're really excited about at the moment. Lovely, thank you Kirsty. If we could now have Julia Hello. from Bristol Museum, please. Hi everyone, I'm Julia. I'm curator of art at Bristol Museum and Art Gallery. Our invitation to artists is to work with a multidisciplinary museum collection that includes art, archaeology, history, science. We're directing your attention to specific areas, as you'll see in the short PowerPoint, but we are open to your suggestions. The context is Bristol, and many of you will be aware of the toppling of the statue of Edward Colston in 2020. In my prep for the 2020 project, the UAL one, I mean, I have been reading the case studies for doing the work, um, which was a programme of decolonising workshops held in 2021. Doing the work is an appropriate title. It's all of our work to enact anti-racism and labour to decentre the narratives presented in our museums. I mentioned some of the projects that Bristol Museum and Art Gallery have been working on to this end in the PowerPoint. 
I like this quote from the African-American artist Stacey Lynn Waddell. My contribution is small, it's incremental, it's consistent. In Bristol's acquisitions of modern and contemporary art, there's a focus on representing post-colonial perspectives, more women and more LGBTQ plus artists. Our programme is broad ranging from the post-colonial exhibits and events to mark the Remembrance Sunday, to interventions this year with Peter Brathwaite and Yinka Shonabare. These are just a few examples. The work is ongoing. To reiterate, it's all of our work to enact anti-racism and Bristol's involvement with 2020 is our part of doing the work. Thank you, Julia. Could we have Martin from the Herbert, please? Hello, I'm uh, Martin Roberts, Curatorial Manager at the Herbert Art Gallery and Museum in Coventry. Um, as with the other galleries, we can offer a broad range of collections, including social and industrial history, archaeology, natural sciences and visual art. And this includes uh, a special collection on themes of conflict, peace and reconciliation, uh, reflecting Coventry's experiences during the Second World War. All of these collections will be readily accessible to the artist and we're also keen to discuss the possibility of displaying the final work in the gallery here. We're committed to the 2020 project because we really want to make our collections and public programme more diverse and representative of our audiences. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. If we could have Guy from Kettle's Yard now, please. Hi there, I'm Guy Hayward. I'm a curator at Kettle's Yard, which is one of uh, the University of Cambridge's um, eight museums. Um, we're a modern and contemporary art gallery, and we have a collection of modern art, some of which is displayed in quite a unique set of domestic spaces, which you'll see in the video shortly, um, and also a renowned exhibitions programme with recent exhibitions from artists like uh, Ai Weiwei, Howardina Pindell, uh, Should be biz was and Judy Moretu, among many others. Um, so this is all in the context of the University of Cambridge, as I said. So I guess one of the unique things about us as an arts organisation within a large university is that through commissions and residencies, we're able to open up opportunities for artists to access research communities um, across Cambridge, across all sorts of disciplines, um, and also within the university's other museums. So we're really pleased to be part of this programme led by the brilliant team at UAL and we're committed to supporting an artist to develop a project and I hope to interrogate our collection from a completely new different perspective. Thanks. Thank you Guy. We will now present uh, the videos that were created by the six partners who gave a, a brief introduction just now. Each video is three to five minutes long. So this should take us to about 2.40, at which point we will have a little break. So the videos will be presented in order of Birmingham Museums Trust, The Box, Bradford Museums and Galleries, Bristol Museum and Art Gallery, the Herbert and Kettle's Yard. Birmingham Museums Trust is at an exciting point in its history. In 2021, we began a multi-year transformation under the leadership of new co-CEOs Sara Wajid and Zach Mensa. Hope, trust and social belonging will be at the heart of what we do as we actively work towards a model of mass participation. Audiences and communities will play a leading role in shaping BMT through consultation, collaboration and co-production. Digital access and engagement will be central to our work. We want to treat the objects in our care not as static remnants of the past, but as dynamic conversation pieces. We will use them to activate debate, inspire performance and promote contemporary ideas exchange. Birmingham Museums Trust was set up as an independent charity in 2012. It manages the museum collections of the City of Birmingham across nine sites. This includes the Museum Collections Centre, which provides public and research access to around 800,000 objects held in storage. Birmingham holds a vast collection of over one million objects and artworks, covering almost every subject across art and decorative arts, natural science, human history and science and technology. The collection was begun in the early 1860s and predates all the museum venues. Among the first items the city collected was the Sultan Ganj Buddha, excavated in Bihar in 1861. 
the collection and establishment of the museum are inextricably linked to Britain's imperial and industrial past. Birmingham's super diverse population is also a lasting connection to the city's colonial history. In the 21st century, one in 10 Brummies was born in a Commonwealth country other than the UK. Birmingham is one of the most ethnically diverse cities for its size in Europe. Over 40% of the population are from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. It is also one of the youngest cities in Europe. Despite significant progress over the last few years, these statistics are not yet matched in our visitor profile. We also know that our collection doesn't reflect the diversity of the city as it should. We have been working towards more fully representing the city's people through a commitment to audience-led collecting. The Collecting Birmingham project engaged with communities in Birmingham to identify items to represent them and their lives. Acquisitions made included important works by Donald Rodney and the Rivers of Birmingham series by acclaimed Birmingham photographer Vanley Burke. Last year, 53% of all approved acquisitions were by or representing people of colour. Our displays for the Commonwealth Games have also been an opportunity to develop our social purpose in relation to collections displays. We Are Birmingham was co-curated with Don't Settle, an organisation that empowers young people of colour. Soho House hosted an exhibition with Vanley Burke examining the Black British experience. Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery is currently closed for renovation, so the Museum Collections Centre will be the key site for the 2020 artist. The Collections Centre is a fantastic resource to inspire creativity. However, it also contains collections that are problematic through their links to Britain's imperial past, who objects were acquired by, the circumstances of their collection, and how and when they came to Birmingham. There are also areas of the collection that are still under-researched. We regularly work with contemporary artists to open up and reframe historic collections. BMT hosts an artist annually through the Whitworth Wallace Fellowship, and since 2020, the Cut Copy Remix program has encouraged and supported artists in using images of the collection to inspire new digital and analog work. Each year, a guest lead artist produces a commission responding to BMT's digital resource or its thousands of images. In 2020, the lead artist was Cold War Steve, whose work included two humorous and satirical takes on the city's pre-Raphaelite collection. Earlier this year, BMT hosted contemporary Pacifica artists Rosanna Raymond and Jamie Whitey and the Savage Club Collective in partnership with Fierce. Working remotely from New Zealand, the artists created a Savage Club room in Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery. It brought together historic artefacts from Birmingham's Pacific collection, loans from Savage Club members and contemporary pieces by First Nations Pacifica artists. Through Rosanna and Jamie's practice, the historic artefacts were awakened and brought back to life as the past and present, the living and the dead, met together in the same space. With BMT's aim of mass participation and consultation at its heart, the 2020 Commission will be developed through the artist's own practice, informed by digital and in-person engagement with communities in the city. We would especially value the opportunity to host an artist from Birmingham or the wider West Midlands, and definitely someone who'd be passionate about engaging with the people of Birmingham. The artist will be supported by staff from BMT to access the collections and consult with local people. We're really excited to be part of the 2020 project. We're looking forward to welcoming an artist who will work with us and with the people of Birmingham, using the collections in our care for inspiration. The collections at the box number over two million objects, ranging from archaeology through decorative art, fine art, paintings and sculpture, natural history, social, maritime and city history. The box's social history collections are mostly English. Some of the notable collections include South West Gas Historical Society collection and material from the People's Plymouth Exhibition, which was held in 2007, during which the old museum acquired a large quantity of social history items from the 20th century. Contemporary visual arts are embedded in the fabric, policies, programmes and collections of the box. Through working with artists, we aim to offer relevant and challenging perspectives and fresh connections between history and contemporary life. At The Box, we work with artists in many different ways, and we particularly look for long-term dialogues, which allow for meaningful projects to take place. When inviting artists to look at our collections, local histories and heritage, we make sure that they really become part of the team in Plymouth. 
We worked with artists such as Zadie, Cha, Alberta, Whittle, Kahinda Wiley and Jeffrey Gibson amongst many others. We have also launched open calls and bursaries to support artists in their research and development phase, as well as coordinating several meetings with experts and academics in the city to ensure knowledge was shared and strong connections made. This is 100 Journeys, one of our permanent gallery spaces here at the box, and it showcases our World Cultures collection. You can see across the different cases the various stories of people who have set sail from Plymouth to explore the world and the impact that that has had on the world at large. We're really committed to decolonisation and using decolonisation principles through our collection. We'd love to work with you to explore how we can ensure this space is more inclusive and more representative and how artists can help us explore those collections and challenge um, some of those inherent narratives. We have the Cotonian Collection, which is a designated collection of international importance and was bequeathed to the people of Plymouth by William Cotton, from whom it takes its name. The collection was largely assembled during the 18th century by Charles Rogers and then two further generations of the family up until 1863. Another significant collection is the media collection. This helps form the core of our media gallery. Welcome in to our wonderful media archive stores and these stores enable us to care for and preserve the largest regional film archive in the country as well as over two million photographic objects going right back to the 1830s including an original daguerreotype that can be attributed right here in Plymouth. Now we're really keen to dig deeper into the collections to really bring out those diverse representational narratives and stories and we know that there is a lot more to uncover within these collections. So our collections cover a wide range of objects and stories representing a wide range of cultures from the period central to the development and growth of the British Empire. The artists working with us will have access to all of these and any curatorial help they need, including access to the 500,000 or so paper archives here in the strong room. We're really excited to welcome you to the box and to work with us. Hi, my name is Kirsty Young and I am Assistant Curator for Bradford District Museums and Galleries and I'm here today to give you a brief introduction to our sites and our collections. I form part of a team which looks after four sites. We have Bolling Hall, Bradford Industrial Museum, Cliff Castle and Cartwright Hall. Alongside our buildings we look after over 900,000 objects. This collection of objects includes a selection of fine art, and in the 1980s, the service began actively collecting the work of South Asian and black artists to better reflect the contemporary population of Bradford. Uh, we have decorative arts, um, industrial heritage, which includes our designated Worcester collection, which preserves Bradford's unique um, textile heritage and highlights Bradford's significant role in the Worcester industry. We have zoology specimens, geology specimens, botany specimens, archaeology and social history. And we have a collection of photographs and negatives. One part of our photography collection, which may be of particular interest for this project, is the Bellevue Collection. The Bellevue Studio opened in Manningham, close to Cartwright Hall in the 1920s. And as other studios lost customers and closed in the 1950s, Bellevue had a new lease of life photographing people arriving from Eastern Europe, the Caribbean and South Asia. The identities of most of the people in these photos from the 1950s and the 1970s are unknown. However, people have begun to search our website and we've begun to put um, photographs up around all of our different sites. Um, and people have started recognising portraits of their family, friends and themselves and con contacting us to say who they recognise. We will be able to offer access to a range of these collections, um, either in person or digitally for this project. And the residency will be based at Cartwright Hall Art Gallery. Standing in Lister Park, about a mile from Bradford City Centre, Cartwright Hall was built on the site of Manningham Hall, the former home of local mill owner Samuel Cunliffe Lister, and it opened as a gallery in 1904. 
Originally, the hall housed a display of loaned artworks before acquiring its own collection of Victorian and Edwardian works using funds from the 1904 Bradford Industrial Exhibition, which coincided with the opening of Carwright Hall. Today, the gallery has a space dedicated to Bradford-born artist David Hockney, where we have a unique collection of his early works. We have a print room which houses a large collection of prints, including works by um, printmakers such as William Blake, Andy Warhol and Richard Hamilton. Um, our permanent galleries on the first floor focus on the history of the building, people and the idea of place. Bradford is a cosmopolitan city and by 2025, more than half the population will have South Asian, Eastern European, African, Caribbean, J Gypsy Traveller, Roma and Arab heritage, amongst many others. Now we look at the journeys that people have made to and from Bradford, either by choice, for industry or due to civil unrest and the places that people call home. Through our artworks, we also look at the idea of people and the diversity of our communities. We display our works of art alongside one another without discriminating against the age, sex, race or sexual orientation of the artist. Although these details are sometimes featured in the interpretation. We try to be inclusive in these displays, but we are aware that there will still be gaps, especially as the lives and stories of our local communities change and develop. Um, our two most recent sets of acquisitions which were on display in these galleries are The Burden by Turkish-born Esna Su, which explores the issues of identity and memory and how these are shaken in the context of political instability, and Charmaine Watkins' Knowledge Keeper and We Are Here, who, led by her Jamaican heritage, navigates and reimagines ideas of ancestry, tradition, ritual and cosmology. On the ground floor, we have two temporary gallery spaces. Um, with these spaces, we often work directly with groups in the local communities to co-curate exhibitions or use our collections to explore ideas such as family and home, which opens up conversations across the gr age groups and cultures. Our learning officer at this site covers Fairy Tale Explorer, Hello Hockney, We Work at the Gallery, Hockney Techniques, Larry Landscapes, The Art and Science of Noticing, The Art of Early Islamic Civilization, British Values, The Vikings in the Muslim World, and we do a takeover day. A part of our focus, um, our vision, for vision focuses on creative people and cultural communities. Included in this, we aim to build a distinctive sense of place in Bradford District, um, which based on our diverse heritage and culture, to promote physical and mental health and well-being among all our communities, to enable everyone to learn, develop skills, build confidence and understand their place in the world and to work in partnership to ensure that everyone in Bradford District has access to ambitious world-class art, heritage and cultural experiences. And these are areas which we are interested in developing. Uh, Bradford has just been announced as a City of Culture 2025 and there will be lots of activity taking place across the city over the next few years in the lead up to this. And we look forward to an artist from this project joining us on this exciting journey. My name's Julia Carver and I'm Curator of Art at Bristol Museum and Art Gallery. I'm going to talk about some of the collections at the museum and the opportunities this commission holds. Bristol Art Gallery and Museum of Antiquities opened in 1905 next door to the Museum of Natural History and was originally conceived as a separate institution to the museum, which had opened in 1823 as the Bristol Institution for the Advancement of Science and Art. The gallery was paid for with the help of a grant of £60,000, now worth about £7 million, from the tobacco magnate and liberal politician Sir William Henry Wills, later Lord Winterstoke. Designed by Sir Frank William Wills, the cousin of Lord Winterstoke, the Edwardian Baroque building was extended after World War I with a further gift from the Wills family. In World War II, during the Blitz of November 1940, a bomb was dropped on the museum building, destroying the interior and some of the collection, with just traces remaining, known as the ghost collections. The museum's surviving collections were moved to the art gallery building, where they have remained ever since. The collections include art, applied art, Asian art, archaeology, Egyptology and world cultures, geology, natural history, social and industrial and maritime history and the city's archives. 
There are seven sites, including Bristol Museum and Art Gallery, M Shed, the Archives, Blaise Castle Museum and the Roman Villa, as well as two historic houses, Red Lodge and Georgian House. There is much material for an artist wishing to unpick the colonial strands in the history of Bristol Museum, be it the origins of funding from tobacco wealth, the actual ownership of enslaved people, or the histories of empire. In 2021, we presented the statue of Edward Colston that was toppled by protesters in 2020 at M Shed in its fallen state. And the Black Lives Matter Commission at Bristol Museum and Art Gallery. This is the context in which the UAL 2020 Commission will find a home. Georgian House was built by John Pinney, the owner of a sugar plantation on Nevis, who returned to Bristol with his servants, an enslaved African Caribbean named Pera Jones, and the manumitted Francis Coker. Pero is memorialised in Bristol with a bridge, but there is scope to explore his story and or that of Francis, complementing the commission I discussed below. While Francis was freed, Pero remained enslaved at his death, aged 45. Dapinya Kaganya, Leave the Light When You Leave the Good, by South African artist Labourhan Kaganya, explores the history of the house of the trader, Pinney. The three-channel black and white video installation is a response to the historic erasure of names and oral traditions. A new commission for 2020 could focus on the stories of Pero Jones and or Francis Coker. Since 2012, the museum has held the British Empire and Commonwealth Collection which includes art, objects, photographs and film footage, largely donated by people who worked in the colonised countries of the empire, giving an insight into the histories of British colonialism, usually from the perspective of the colonisers. Empire Through the Lens was an exhibit of photographs selected to open up some of these histories. A new commission could continue this work with the collection. A new commission could take the decentering approach of the World Cultures Collection, exploring global perspectives beyond the West. The World Cultures Collection is broad ranging, with material from the Americas, Africa and the Pacific, that range from everyday life to ritual, birth, marriage and death. Such sites and collections have been the starting point for strong post-colonial programming and collecting such as Mimesis, African Soldier by John O'Confra, currently showing at BMAG. Our decolonising projects include Uncomfortable Truths, a series of podcasts by young people made pre-lockdown, which can be accessed on our website, bristolmuseums.org.uk. Bristol's participation in UAL 2020 falls during the bicentenary of the Museum's Foundation Organisation, Bristol Institution for the Advancement of Science and the Arts. As well as the story of Pero Jones, or the histories of empire, we would like to put forward an option for the candidate to examine ideas about foundation stories or gender, taking the first art acquisition as a point of departure. The museum purchased Eve at the Fountain in 1826. This sculpture was carved by the Bristol artist Edward Hodges Bailey, who carved Nelson's statue on Trafalgar Square. It illustrates a moment described in Milton's poem Paradise Lost, when Eve is seduced by her own image seen reflected in a pool. The carving in white marble invites us to consider vanity as an intrinsically feminine attribute. But there are many more perspectives to be explored, not least beyond the Eurocentric conceptualising of Judeo-Christian culture. In this anniversary year, it will be exciting to see a commission that focused on this sculpture and drew out, decentered and critiqued some of the ideas within it. 
summarise, we're very open to what area of the collection the candidate decides to work with. And it could also include the ghost collections in natural history, mentioned very briefly at the beginning of this presentation. However, we'd be particularly interested in ideas surrounding Children House and Pera Jones, the British Empire and Commonwealth Collection, or World Cultures Collections, or Eve at the Fountain. For your residency, we would invite you to visit the museum and explore before you decide on the aspect of the collection that you would be interested to engage with. Access would be a combination of in-person and online. And we would offer content material as a point of departure, but also give you freedom to develop your practice. We would be thrilled if this commission could form part of our 200th anniversary events in 2023, but we are open to your ideas. The Herbert Art Gallery and Museum was founded a couple of years after the end of the Second World War with the help of a significant donation from Sir Alfred Herbert, a prominent local industrialist. Today the Herbert is a lively and popular venue which attracts around 230,000 visitors each year from the local area and much further afield. We have a very strong creative programme and learning offer and we work closely with communities across the city. A range of permanent galleries showcase the museum's collections which include social and industrial history, archaeology, natural sciences and visual art. The History Gallery tells the story of Coventry and its people from the medieval period to the present day and features our archaeology and social history collections. In archaeology, the medieval holdings are the main strength, with items relating to domestic life, trades and industries, religion and so on. But we also have material from prehistory and the Roman period. In the Victorian section, we look at ribbon weaving and watchmaking, the two main industries at the time. We have large collections relating to both, plus a wealth of material relating to education, leisure, health and welfare, etc. We also have an important collection relating to the author George Eliot, who went to school in Coventry and spent an important part of her early life here. The 20th century section of the display is the biggest, reflecting the strength of the collection. This includes material on life in the Second World War, the rebuilding of the city after the war, the industries that most people worked in and the kinds of consumer goods they were buying. We have significant collections of material representing the city's diverse communities, much of it collected through community projects. One of these is a collection relating to the Indian Workers Association, which was founded in Coventry in 1939. One of our most important collections relates to Coventry's role in promoting peace and reconciliation which began with the destruction of the cathedral in the Blitz of 1940. We have a permanent gallery which tells this story and showcases some of the artworks we have collected on themes of conflict, peace and reconciliation. The strength of the art collection is in 20th century works by British artists and in particular works depicting British life and landscape. This was begun by the gallery's first director, John Hewitt, in 1957 and includes some of our most important pieces by artists like L.S. Lowry, Stanley Spencer, Paul Nash, Graham Sutherland and David Bomberg. However, the collection is very much skewed towards work by white male artists. There are fewer works by female artists and very few works by artists of colour, nor is there much to reflect the experiences of diverse communities in the depictions of British life, which mostly show rural landscapes or industrial towns and cities populated by white working class people. In the early 1980s, the Herbert exhibited the work of the Black Art Group, including Claudette Johnson, Donald Rodney, Eddie Chambers and Keith Piper, but did not acquire any of their work for the permanent collection. We are currently working with Coventry University and UAL to explore the legacy of the Black Art movement in the Midlands and have made some steps towards addressing the imbalance in our collection, with the acquisition of works by Claudette Johnson, Van Lee Burke, Frank Bowling and Barbara Walker. However, there remains much work to be done here, and this is an area we are keen to build on. In addition to the modern works, we have a small collection of older paintings, many of which were acquired by the City Corporation between the 1500s and the early 1900s, as well as a large number of topographical views from the 18th and 19th centuries. There are also a number of paintings and artefacts relating to the story of Lady Godiva, one of Coventry's most famous citizens and still a powerful symbol of protest today. 
Finally, we have the Natural Sciences Collection, which encompasses taxidermy specimens, skeletal material, birds' eggs, rocks and minerals, fossils, and most importantly, entomology. This is notable for several collections of butterflies and moths, many of which come from other countries and very much reflect a colonial approach to collecting and classifying. Kettle's Yard is a house and gallery that is part of the University of Cambridge. Founded in 1957 by Jim and Helen Ede, it was their home until the 1970s when they moved away to live in Edinburgh. It became a permanent home to their collection of mainly British and European modern art, as well as found objects, furniture and textiles. Alongside the house can be found exhibition galleries and other public spaces that reopened in 2018 following a major building project. In the 1920s, Jim Ede was a curator at what was then the Tate Gallery, and through his time there and beyond, he developed friendships with a number of avant-garde artists of the time, including Ben Nicholson, Barbara Hepworth, Winifred Nicholson and Christopher Wood. Many of their works can be found in the permanent displays of the Kettles Yard House today, which is largely as the Ede's left it. The house and collection were gifted to the University of Cambridge in 1966 and remain part of the university today, now open to all six days a week. Significant works of art are displayed alongside very precisely placed objects, all in a unique domestic environment which used to be a home and where there are no labels. As Ede put it, the house should not be considered an art gallery or museum, nor simply a collection of works of art reflecting my taste or the taste of a given period. It is rather a continuing way of life. While the house could be considered a work of art in its own right, Despite Ede's assertion, today it's clear that the collection presents a limited view of art from a particular moment in time, and does not tell the full story of art in the 20th century, within the Western canon and beyond. The collection was originally a personal one, based on connections and friendships with a specific group of artists. There are few artists of colour represented, and it's noticeable that art by white male artists dominates the permanent displays. Inspired by the Eads' belief in the value of looking at and living with art and found objects, Kettle's Yard is now planning to embark on a new programme thread that will bring together and move forward work to make the house and collection more relevant and accessible to as many people as possible. We recognise that there are untold histories and new approaches to interpretation that will enable wider audiences to engage with and enjoy visiting and experiencing the house and collection. We want to see a creative rejuvenation of the Eads vision, with artists still at the centre of this new phase. It's a programme that will evolve, is open-ended and can take many forms, including commissioning new research and new perspectives on the collection from a range of diverse voices, and reviewing existing written interpretation and information about the house and collection. Within this broader thread is Kettles Yard's participation in a shared project with the other University of Cambridge Museums, or UCM, that explores the legacies of empire and enslavement within our collections. The UCM project involves new and ongoing research and is underpinned by a commitment to opening up the history of our collections to interrogation from a range of perspectives, using them as an opportunity to examine challenging topics, including racial inequality, existing practices around collections and programming, as well as better understanding the complex histories of our collections and how they may have benefited financially from the proceeds of enslavement. We hope that the 2020 residency will be an opportunity for an artist to connect with these wider programmes of activity, as well as engage deeply with our collection, permanent displays and archive, both in person and online. It will be an opportunity to become embedded in Kettle's Yard and work with curators, researchers and academics within the wider University of Cambridge to discover new ways of thinking about our collection. Thank you to all our collection partners who introduced their uh, fantastic and diverse collections in the first part of the session. We will now take a five minute break. So please do come back at five minutes to three at 2.55. Welcome back. As we have quite a, a busy schedule, as already mentioned, we will uh, continue straight on 
I hope you had uh, the chance to make yourself a lovely cup of tea and you're ready to hear from more of our collection partners. Uh, we will do another round of uh, brief introductions from six partners. That is Leeds Art Gallery, Manchester Art Gallery, MIMA, National Museums Liverpool, National Museums Northern Ireland, Wolverhampton, art gallery and then we will present the short films as we did just before our break so if you would like to take over jane thank you hi everyone my name is jane boyery i'm the principal keeper at leeds art gallery which is part of leeds museums and galleries as the city's much loved gallery we are home to one of the best collections of 20th century british art outside london and we're free to visit the collection continues to grow and we're actively collecting work by UK based artists from the global majority, most recently Veronica Ryan and Mohammed Barangi. We're really thrilled to be part of the National 2020 programme. Look forward to offering in-depth access to our collection and to our curators and engagement colleagues. You'll be welcome with open arms and we look forward to challenging and inspiring conversations during the residency. We have a long history of working with artists from diverse backgrounds through the exhibitions and engagements. However, the, this commission is something new and exciting for us all at the gallery and for our local communities. As you know, we're a really diverse city here in Leeds. 2020 marks an important moment to consolidate learning from our decolonizing Shifting Perspectives exhibition and actively support an artist at a pivotal moment in their career with a meaningful legacy. Being part of this national network, getting to know the partners, and the artist has been enriching and empowering as a collective voice advocating for profound change in our programmes. Thank you, Jane. If we could have Natasha from Manchester. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Natasha Howes. I'm Senior Curator uh, at Manchester Art Gallery and also on the call with me is my colleague Kate Jessen, who's the Curator of Modern and Contemporary and works a lot with the collections. Um, so we're really thrilled to be part of um, this project um, and we've done a couple of commissions in the last few years um, which have been really, I suppose, instrumental and fundamental to our kind of our, our, our learning and um, how the collection is developing. Um, in 2019, we worked with Sonia Boyce, who wanted to investigate um, gender trouble in the galleries. Um, and she also looked at um, uh, race and sexuality and her work that she made six acts um, came into the collection and has really um, and we're showing it in our Victorian galleries and it really challenges assumptions about power. The second project which is quite similar to 2020 we worked um, on a project with Innova called Future Collect um, where the, we worked with Jade Montserrat um, who was in residence with us although it happened during Covid and it was all digital um, and she made um, some new work that's come into the collection. So the reason why I'm particularly thrilled um, that we're part of this this project is that I think we learn so much from artists and I'm really looking forward to going on that journey with the artists, discovering things from our collection and um, the artists creating a new work. Thanks. Thank you, Natasha. If we could have uh, Helen from Mima now. Hi there everyone, I'm Helen, curator at MIMA, the Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art, and we have a civic mission to actively commission, collect and platform international, contemporary and modern art. We're unique as we're partnered with Teesside University and we run and we're part of the School of Arts and Creative Industries. And so you'll have the opportunity to join an exciting community of practitioners and researchers and we can offer on-site research and study space and access to making facilities and expertise as part of Teesside University. Uh, the 2020 Brilliant Programme aligns with our mission to support engagement and increased access and knowledge around our collection. And we're really committed to supporting artists to actively commission um, and to collect through that commissioning process. 2020 really aligns to our commitment to actively platform new practices and perspectives and voices um, within our holdings. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. If we could have uh, Charlotte from National Museums Liverpool now, please. Hi everyone, my name is Charlotte Keenan and I am Head of Walker Art Gallery. 
part of National Museums Liverpool. We're a group of seven museums and galleries on Merseyside, which includes three art galleries, the Lady Lever, Sudley and the Walker, as well as the Museum of Liverpool, the Maritime Museum and the International Slavery Museum. Um, in our video, we focus very much on the fine art collections at the Walker, and that is where this commission would be focused, but we're really interested in exploring that relationship between the Walker and our fine art collections and that broader multidisciplinary context. Um, we're very excited to be part of 2020. It's a scheme that really coincides with our organisational priorities at the moment to really interrogate the history of our collections and start to um, think differently about our collecting practices for the future. And I can't wait to see um, some of the proposals to work with us. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. If we could have uh, Anna Leeshing from National Museums Northern Ireland now, please. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I feel like I have a camera that's too fancy for its own good today. So um, it's sort of just delayed, but there I am. Okay, hi. Um, my name is Anna Leeshing, and I am curator of art at um, National Museums NI, but I primarily look after the Ulster Museum Art Collection, which is based right in Botanic Gardens in the heart of um, South Belfast. Um, thanks everyone for um, coming along today. It's really exciting to see the numbers and the amount of people who are interested in this amazing project. And we're really excited at National Museums NI to, to take a part in the project and sort of um, have an impact in this way. I think it's a really interesting time to become part of the activity at the Ulster Museum. Um, the centre of my own curatorial practice and kind of mission in the museum is to um, trouble and reassess and develop the collection. And I've done quite a lot of exciting things with that in the last few years, some of which I've outlined in the video. And also one of my main focuses in the next few years is for the museum to better represent the communities that it serves. And I think this project will really help with that. Um, just thinking of other conversations that other museums are kind of having um, and in their introductions, I think obviously colonialism has come up a lot. And I think here in the north, we're in a very interesting and kind of slippery place when it comes to conversations around colonial, colonialism, because we really are on both sides of that conversation. And it's something I'm really interested in exploring with an artist, because it's the chance for us to really look at what isn't there and what isn't represented within the collections. Also, there's wonderful conversations that could be had around identity and representation as well. Um, from a practical um, point of view, I think the Ulster Museum is an interesting place because even though we're a national collection, we are very small um, compared to other nationals. Um, I think it means our collection is kind of, you can get your head around it maybe in an easier way than you would with another national collection. We have. Um, artwork representing sort of art that has happened from sort of early 1500s to what is happening um, around the world currently today. But I think it's still something that is accessible and easy to manage. And also because we are um, the art gallery that sits alongside history and natural sciences, there will be opportunity for you to connect with those co um, connections and curators. But um, please, I know our contact details are through this, so please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions about the collection or want to know more. Um, I'm here to, to be talked to. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. If we could have finally Carol from Wolverhampton Art Gallery. Hi. Um, hello, everybody. Again, great, great that so many people are on the call. Uh, I'm Carol Thompson, Senior Curator for Wolverhampton Arts and Culture. Uh, we're really, really excited to be part of the 2020 project. And we're very much looking forward to having an artist work with our team and with the gallery's collection. We hold around 18,000 items in the collection, so not one of the larger um, collections or um, organisations involved, but a really wide range, uh, including fascinating works relating to the Black Country's industrial history, uh, as well as really important collections of historical, modern and contemporary art, uh, such as our renowned pop art collection, works relating to the troubles of Northern Ireland and one of the most significant collections of work by artists associated with the British Black Art Movement. Wolverhampton was actually the, the first um, public gallery to host an exhibition by young black artists in 1981 um, and uh, so those artists were people like Eddie Chambers and Keith Piper 
Um, and we have a really strong collection of work by the artists who were involved with that, the Black Art Group. Wolverhampton has uh, one of the most multicultural populations in the UK, and we're totally committed to making the gallery more representative, more relevant and more meaningful to the people we serve, and to using our collections to provoke important and um, you know, timely conversations. 2020 offers a really fantastic opportunity for this. Uh, so thanks for your interest in the project and uh, I look forward to any, any questions that you might have. Thank you, Carol. Thank you to all the collection partners who did a quick uh, whistle stop introduction. We will now present uh, short videos of three to five minutes from Leeds Art Gallery, Manchester Art Gallery, MIMA, National Museums Liverpool, National Museums Northern Ireland and Wolverhampton Art Gallery. Hello, I'm Jane Boyer, Principal Keeper at Leeds Art Gallery. The gallery is part of Leeds Museums and Galleries, one of the largest local authority run museum services in England. This grounds us within communities, gives a civic role for social justice, arts led care, health and wellbeing and environmental responsibility. And it's a tourist attraction which brings visitors into the city. The image here shows the entrance to the gallery, which is adjacent to the library in the heart of Leeds city centre. We're free for everyone to visit and pre-COVID had half a million visitors a year. We work closely with the Henry Moore Institute, who are located next door. The gallery opened its doors in 1888, and the art collection is of national importance with principal strengths in 18th and early 19th century English watercolours, 20th century British art, and a modern sculpture collection more extensive than any other regional gallery in the UK. We're well known for our significant holdings of late 19th century pictures, which are strong in Victorian narrative painting you can see in this image. Some of these are displayed in the Ziff Gallery pictured. Throughout its history, the gallery has worked with contemporary artists, as it did in the Victorian times, and engaged with its local communities. We have 10 galleries across two floors, with a busy programme of exhibitions, collection displays, and a magnificent central court for commissions. We work with people of all ages. The extensive and impressive collection includes important works by remarkable artists such as Francis Bacon, Fuller de Barlow, Anne Hardy, Barbara Hepworth, Lebena Himid, Henry Moore, Harold Offay, Paul Rago, Rhoda, pictured here, Veronica Ryan and Martine Sims. Across our nine sites, we have around 1,300 oil paintings, 3,000 English watercolours, 2,000 prints and about 1,000 sculptures. I wanted to draw your attention to our recent and timely exhibition, Shifting Perspectives, most relevant to the 2020 project. This explored and challenged representations and misrepresentations of people of African, Caribbean and Asian heritage, drawing on the city's collection and its colonial legacies. It marked an important moment in centering the voices of communities in a way that had not been done before and was produced in collaboration. It examined mechanisms of stereotyping, othering and normalising unequal power relations. The show aimed to challenge dominant narratives while exploring how these were constructed and perpetuated. It brought together nearly 100 collection works ranging from the 17th century to the present day, with artworks created by artists of the global majority, shown alongside those by white artists to explore parallels and divergences. Artists included Shaheen Afrasiabi, pictured here, Karen Babian, Jacob Epstein, William Hogarth, Yinka Alori, Jade Montserrat, Ronald Moody, Rembrandt, Rob, Bob and Roberta Smith, and Barbara Walker. The collection drawing by Barbara Walker is part of an ongoing series by the artist that explores the visibility or lack thereof of black people in Western European painting and opens interesting conversations with other works in Leeds's collection. The exhibitions opened up important interaction with our audiences. Visitors shared their responses with these comments then added to the work's interpretation labels on the wall and as part of the collection work's future archival record. We love to animate the galleries through performance. Here you see a dancer from South Asian Arts respond to the 1858 painting Retribution by Edward Armitage in the Ziff Gallery. This powerful and contentious painting, which we are addressing through new interpretation with more work still to be done. We have an award-winning engagement programme with regular activity with local schools and 
community groups. We work closely with the city's thriving further education and higher education sector, as well as with different communities. We are actively continuing to collect work in different mediums by artists from the global majority, and we work with key partners to do this, including Contemporary Art Society, the Art Fund, and Leeds Art Fund. We're looking forward to displaying our most recent acquisition, Veronica Ryan's sculpture, which will be joining us when the Turner Prize finishes. We're thrilled to be part of the 2020 programme. As I hope you can see, we are dedicated to working with diverse artists through commissioning, exhibitions and collecting, and look forward to this opportunity with care and trust towards a rewarding collaboration. We're open to working with artists from across the UK. However, it is important that selected artists spend time with the collection in person. Given the nature of the opportunity, it would be of particular interest for the artist to engage with a work or works in the Ziff Gallery, which displays Victorian art to build on the gallery's commitments to explore colonial legacies. And it is our hope that the artist will be inspired to continue this work. It's Manchester Art Gallery's 200th birthday next year. The gallery was initiated in 1823 by artists and industrialists as an educational institution to ensure that the city and its people grow with creativity, imagination, health and productivity. It was originally called the Royal Manchester Institution for the promotion of literature, science and the arts and was built by public subscription. Today, the gallery is free and open to all people as a place of civic thinking and public imagination, promoting art to achieve social change. It has been at the centre of city life for 200 years and been proudly part of Manchester City Council since 1882. The gallery is home to the city's public collections of fine art, craft and design, and dress and costume. We care for, develop and share our collections to tell stories, inspire learning, ignite conversation, enhance personal well-being, and contribute to positive cultural and social change. Our vision is to be an inclusive art gallery for the people of Manchester and the wider world, opening minds to the essential role of creativity in making a healthy society. Understanding and putting to good use the collections we hold underpins our work. How can we make the most of our collections? with all the complex power dynamics they represent, to better understand the past, interrogate the present, inform and inspire the future. The history of the gallery's collection is intrinsically entangled with the histories of the city, the social, political and economic shifts that have shaped its expansion, ambition and identity over two centuries. The collection has been formed through intention, accident, opportunity, idealism, realism, and individual and collective aspiration. There are a number of under-researched areas from the collection which artists might be interested in exploring. The Rutherston Loan Collection. In 1925, the gallery secured the gift of 800 works of modern and contemporary British art from Bradford businessman and philanthropist Charles Rutherston in order to provide a picture loan scheme for schools and colleges including works by all the major artists of the period, such as Gwen John and Augustus John, Duncan Grant and Vanessa Bell, Wyndham Lewis and Paul Nash, the Rutherston collection formed the basis of the gallery's modern painting collection. Furniture. There are over 500 pieces of seating, lighting, tables, sideboards, and much more that we have collected since 1908. The collection ranges from the 16th century to today. Textiles. Manchester Art Gallery's textile collection includes objects from all over the world. Many of these were donated by private collectors during the early 20th century, acquired in earlier times through colonial trade as study material to inform British textile manufacture. Many are fragments cut from larger pieces of cloth or garments acquired for use as examples of making techniques or design. We know very little about their original cultural context, or even, in many cases, what they were once were and where they were made. The Old Manchester Collection. 
This collection includes items from the Old Manchester and Salford exhibition at Queen's Park Art Gallery in 1909-10, about the past history of Manchester and its locality from the earliest times. This includes photographs, prints, drawings, watercolours, coins, seals, stained glass fragments, keys, medals, maps, ballad sheets, newspaper articles, pamphlets, booklets, books, letters, notebooks, scales, a wig curler, shoes, sampler and a scold's bridle. For the residency, we are anticipating that this will be a mix of digital and in person. We have just begun an ambitious Collections Moves project where we are doing capital work to repair our historic buildings and improve the storage. We've currently run out of space to store the collection. As the objects will be packed and in transit during much of this period, it is impossible to guarantee physical access to see them all. I will be working with the selected artist, but they will have access to my curatorial colleagues who are specialists in different areas of the collection. We are hoping that this new artwork will be a collection highlight of the future. Thank you. I'm Helen Welford, Exhibitions and Collections Curator at MIMA, the Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art, and we're delighted to be part of the 2020 programme and to welcome an artist to work with MIMA and our collections. MIMA connects art, people and ideas to make the world a better place. We have a civic mission to enable the creative agency of the most exciting international contemporary and modern art and to have a transformative impact on the communities that we serve at a hyper-local level, regional level and international level. MIMA is part of the School of Arts and Creative Industries of Teesside University. To give you an insight into the Middlesbrough Collection, the Middlesbrough Collection is at the heart of our artistic programme and comprises 2,350 works of art and craft by UK and international artists from the 1870s to the present day. The collection began in the 1920s and early works were used to persuade the local authority to create the area's first gallery, the Middlesbrough Art Gallery, in 1957, later the Cleveland Gallery, 1973 to 1999, and the Cleveland Craft Centre, 1983 to 2003. MIMA today actively commissioned to acquire artworks for the collection. MIMA opened its doors in 2007 and for the first time the collection was held in one place. The strengths of the collection are post Second World War British painting, contemporary American drawing, 20th century British ceramics, and contemporary European jewellery. We have begun a process of actively addressing gaps in our collection through our acquisitions. And in recent years, we have prioritised work to research and share stories about obscured and forgotten histories within the collection. The Middlesbrough Collection is managed and cared for on site. A meme has a dedicated gallery for the presentation of the collection and a recently opened study centre with a library and archive. We also have an open access collection store which presents the entire collection of ceramics and jewellery and that is also housed at MIMA. Works within the Middlesbrough collection are created with a variety of techniques and examine many different themes. We actively develop the collection through acquisitions, gifts and bequests. We're always finding new opportunities for research and to develop new knowledge around the collection with experts, partners and publics. Here we have an example of a work from the collection by artist Sonia Boyce. It's called Devotional Wallpaper and Placards. It's an installation and the wallpaper gathers the names of 200 black women artists working in the music industry together with 100 placards. The work witnesses the important yet overlooked contribution made by black female artists to British society and to culture. Partnership working is vital and adds new perspectives to our holdings. In 2018, we partnered with the Black Artists and Modernism Research Group and audited the collection for contributions by black artists. The outcome was brought together in an exhibition. The display was structured around key questions for any collection, and these were explored through the perspective of an artwork. 
including where am I, why am I here, who am I, what am I doing and what's next. The idea was to amplify marginalised voices within the collection, to surface practices that may have been sidelined by more dominant narratives and institutional practices. It made us think about what stories are historically privileged and prioritised in collections. And so we welcome your applications and we particularly welcome those applications that focus on uncovering and reimagining overlooked voices and stories. We are open to developing an approach that will be accessible and flexible for the selected artist. For example, we could offer four or more in-person visits to introduce the collection to you with access to the stores and archive at MIMA and periods of remote research. Our curators can support the artist by proposing works based on areas of interest. You will join an exciting community of practitioners, researchers and cultural organisations at many different skills. We can offer on-site research and study space and potentially access to making facilities and wider expertise as part of the School of Arts and Creative Industries at Teesside University. The Walker Art Gallery opened in 1877 as the city's principal art gallery. It was gifted to the city by the brewer Andrew Barclay Walker, who did not have a particular interest in the arts, but he hoped that his generous gift would help him to be accepted by the city's ruling class. Liverpool during the 19th century was a wealthy city undergoing rapid expansion. Grand neoclassical civic buildings, including the Walker and the nearby St George's Hall, reflected the city's cultural aspirations as it vied to compete with Manchester and Birmingham as the country's second city. Liverpool had been a small settlement until the 18th century, when, in 1715, the world's first commercial wet dock opened here, opening the city to international trade, including with Africa and the then West Indies, leading Liverpool to ultimately become known as the slave trading capital of Britain. In recent years, the Walker has accelerated its work to better understand the relationship between its collection and transatlantic slavery. A recent audit of the fine art collections has identified artworks with direct links to slavery, colonialism and empire, for example through the sitter or as previous owners of artworks. Full details of these works are available on our website. Notable figures associated with the collection include Joseph Brooks Yates, Samuel Sandbach, James Aspinall, John Gladstone and William Earle, all of whom amassed enormous fortunes through their investments in shipping and plantations while supporting charitable, cultural and educational institutions in Liverpool and beyond with the money generated through the enslavement of African people. These prominent figures have been described as philanthropists over the centuries and into the present day. We are now beginning to work with communities in Liverpool to explore how best to represent these histories in the gallery. An important part of the Walker's collection is its internationally significant medieval, renaissance and baroque collections, which includes Simone Martini's exquisite panel, Christ Discovered in the Temple, made in 1342, amongst other treasures. This work and other important works in this part of the collection once belonged to the 19th century Liverpool collector William Roscoe. He was a successful lawyer and radical politician and has historically been celebrated as a leading abolitionist who campaigned against the slave trade. However, we recognise now that the situation is more complicated than this, as Roscoe himself indirectly benefited from the proceeds of slavery through family connections. The Walker was initially built as an exhibition venue, primarily to host the annual Liverpool Autumn Exhibition of Contemporary Art, conceived to complement the Royal Academy's Summer Exhibition. However, profits generated by the entry fee to the Autumn Exhibition were used to purchase standout works from that year's exhibition, enabling the Walker to build a significant group of Victorian paintings, including works by the Pre-Raphaelites and their followers, most of whom were dismissed by London-based galleries and collectors as irrelevant and untalented. The standout work in this part of the collection is John Everett Millais' painting, Isabella, made between 1848 and 49, and considered the first ever Pre-Raphaelite painting. It is thought that radical Pre-Raphaelites found a more encouraging and receptive audience in Northern art collectors, many of whom were merchants, newly rich through transatlantic slavery and its related businesses, and less concerned with traditional ideas about painting. 
A rare and important work in our collection is a portrait bust of the American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow by 19th century artist Edmonia Lewis, widely considered the first African-American woman artist. Lewis travelled to Europe from Boston and lived in a commune of women artists in Rome before moving to London where she died. This is the only example of work by Lewis in a public collection in Britain. Her legacy has been incredibly influential on contemporary artists, including Lebena Himid and Maud Salter. The Liverpool Autumn Exhibitions concluded after the Second World War, but the Walker's collection has continued to grow. Most notably, this has been through the John Moore's Painting Prize, an open entry painting competition that today awards a £20,000 prize anonymously to one painter every two years. The prize winner is traditionally purchased for the collection too. The prize has never been won by an ethnically diverse artist of colour, although artists including Frank Bowling are associated with the prize and Rashida Reen was a runner-up, leading to his work Boo 69 entering the collection. More recently, we are working to strategically and actively grow the collection with more works by ethnically diverse artists of colours and those which relate to black history. We are currently working on a project to research and collect work by black British women artists made since the late 1970s, building on the curatorial work of Lebena Himmard and others, which will inform an exhibition opening in October 24 at The Walker. Hi, I'm Anna Leachling and I am Curator of Art here at the Ulster Museum in Belfast, which is part of National Museums NI. We're really excited to be part of the 2020 project and have an artist work with our collections for 15 months. I think this is an amazing opportunity for an artist to really delve into what we have, interrogate it, trouble it, and maybe create some really exciting interventions with the collection working with me over the time period. We're keen to have an artist who will come and visit and spend some time here, but we're happy that if you want to work remotely or um, if you want to engage with us in whatever way is more practical for you and more um, kind of exciting for you as well. The Ulster Museum sits in the heart of South Belfast, within the Botanic Gardens and close to Queen's University. It holds the National Collection of Art, Science and History. The art collection, though could be considered small for a national, is significant and holds examples of all key moments within art history of the last 500 years. It has particular focus on Irish art, in addition to key strengths in post-war British and international art, 20th century print and work by women artists. Though what do we even mean by art history? In recent years, we've been trying to unpack the canonical, patriarchal and colonial narrative of art history and interrogate our collection in new ways through exhibition and acquisition. Recent examples have been Making Her Mark, which looked at the impact women have had on printmaking, Changing Views, which troubled the idea of the artist as traveller and explored the problematic way in which artists have historically captured the other, Collage as a Political Act, which unpacked the connection between collage, the body and the person as political, and most recently, Against the Image, Photography, Media, Manipulation, which included a focus on European refugee crisis. The exciting opportunity with the 2020 project is that we get to invite in a more creative approach. As curators, we have to deal with what we have and work to the constraints of physical collections, financial logistics and conservation needs. As an artist, you can interrogate what's not there and create a meaningful response or challenge the narratives that are. You will also have the opportunity to create connections between the collections and spend time with curators and experts in the other departments of the museum. So I hope that gave you enough information about the possibilities of this project and our collection and what can be done. Um, feel free to contact me during the time frame for applications and I really look forward to um, seeing everybody who applies and, and what you want to do with this project. Wolverhampton Art Gallery is in the heart of the city. It was founded in 1884 at a time when the centre of Wolverhampton was being modernised and expanded to accommodate new businesses that had grown around the metal industries in the region. The gallery also housed the Municipal Art School, which trained industrial designers and artists for the local metal trades.
The art collection quickly grew in size and reputation thanks to donations by several leading local industrialists. The early art collections were mainly Victorian paintings, landscapes and genre paintings, but we now hold a wide collection of modern and contemporary work. Key pieces from the early collection are on show in our Victorian galleries. However, we're currently addressing the very narrow viewpoint that these can present, and we're developing new interpretation to share different historical perspectives. We also hold a significant collection of Georgian paintings with highlights displayed in the Georgian Gallery. This space is regularly booked out for conferences, weddings and other events. It currently presents a very traditional image, but again, we're very keen to introduce a wider range of artwork and different perspectives to represent Wolverhampton's multicultural population. The newer parts of the gallery are modern and spacious and light. The atrium was purpose built in the early 2000s to create a permanent space to present Wolverhampton's pop art collection and to create galleries for major touring exhibitions. Our pop collection, collected mainly in the 1970s and 80s, is the finest regional collection of its kind in the UK and includes work by major British and American pop artists including works by women artists Pauline Boaty and Jan Hayworth. Our Northern Ireland collection, reflecting artists' responses to the Troubles, was established in the 1980s. This is the only regional collection of its kind and includes work by Willie Doherty, Jock McFadden and Effie McWilliam and, uh, and many others. Over the past decade, we've focused on building our Black Art collection the City of Wolverhampton played a significant role in the emergence of the British Black Art Movement. The Art Gallery hosted Black Art and Done, the first exhibition of work by young Black British artists in 1981, which was curated by Eddie Chambers and included work by himself and Keith Piper. This was followed by the first National Black Art Convention at Wolverhampton Polytechnic in 1982. Thanks to support from HLF and other major funders, our collection now includes works by a growing list of major British black artists, including Claudette Johnson, Donald Rodney, Lubaina Himid, Tam Joseph, Chyla Berman, Sonia Boyce, and, and many other artists. The collection continues to grow, and more recently we've acquired works by uh, Yinka Shonabare. As well as our fine art collection, we hold several important decorative art collections which relate to the metalworking industries in Wolverhampton and the surrounding black country towns. The enamelling trade and craft grew and flourished in Wolverhampton and Bilston in the 1700s and 1800s. Outside the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, Wolverhampton had the finest collection of enamels in the country. Wolverhampton was also a leading centre for the craft of Japanning, the application of a, a thick varnish as a base for spectacular decoration on various substrates. This is another collection of national and international significance. With over 18,000 items in the collection, it's impossible to cover everything in a short presentation. But we also have a huge collection of quite interesting dolls and toys many of which reflect very outdated and outmoded attitudes and which are very much in need of reinterpretation. So this presentation just gives a really, really quick overview of our collections, uh, but there's much more to find out if you visit our website. Um, so please take a look and thank you very much for listening. Thank you to all our collection partners for taking the time to prepare these insightful videos and, and to introduce yourselves. Um, I, there, there are lots of questions popping up in the chat, which is fabulous. So I will briefly talk you through the next steps. We are running late. So if you have to leave the information session, by all means, contact us uh, by email and we will relay any collection specific questions to our partners. Maya and I will answer questions about the programme directly and as quickly as we can. 
So next steps are for you all who are interested and eligible to apply, really. Uh, the deadline is the 6th of February, midday. So we are hoping to see applications come through before then. Uh, you'll need to submit responses to the following in either written or video format, uh, either is possible. Um, so a summary of your practice, very short 400 words or three, four minute video, an outline proposal relating to one of the collections, there was a question in chat saying, can we express interest in a second option? That is possible, but we recommend that you develop your proposal specifically with regards to one collection partner. Uh, an outline budget detailing any items of anticipated expenditure over £500. This is obviously a sum summary it's some broad thinking as to how you would allocate the budget to the development of research practice and works to be acquired within uh, the collection partners collection there is one thousand pounds that needs to be uh, allocated to the development of a print for the print portfolio which was mentioned at the beginning of the session a cv so two pages maximum uh, a very uh, short summary of, of your uh, relevant experience in PDF or Word format uh, and examples of your previous work. So up to 10 images uh, in the formats outlined here on the uh, slide. Um, so key dates, as I mentioned, the call closes on the 6th of February at midday. So the, the application portal will close at that stage. Uh, you are free to contact us with any questions or technical issues in uploading documents uh, before then. Uh, the week of the 27th of February, shortlisted applicants will be invited to interview and interviews will take place between the 20th and the 29th of March. Um, we will then notify everybody, set everything up in terms of legal contracts and, uh, and other administrative matters and people will be starting their residencies in May and June 2023. So that's a, that's a whistle stop of the, the next dates to have uh, in your diary really. Um, there will be a recording of the session, which we will upload very shortly on the Call for Artists page. Maya has very helpfully put the link in the chat. Um, so if you have missed uh, a presentation from one of the partners, you will be able to catch up on that shortly. And the 2020 team, that is uh, myself, Maya and Susan puissant Locke, are happy to answer uh, any further questions via email and to pass on uh, collection specific uh, questions to our collection partners. The email is contact2020 at arts.ac.uk. Thank you so much to our collection partners for joining us today and for doing all of the preparation towards this information session. Um, I know all of them are looking forward to uh, having your, your wonderful uh, expressions of interest in hand and to uh, hosting a, a 2020 artist by the summer. Uh, so thank you for your time and we will see you shortly or hear from you shortly. Have a lovely afternoon, everybody. Take care.